Okay, so uh, I also have some questions that I want to ask you. I won't use Slido for this. I'm going to go with the old-fashioned raise your hand way. And I'm going to start with one question already. Who of you knows this logo? Yeah. Have you recognized that there is a little beta, you know, on the left quarter? It means that, you know, now I have a new question. Who of you signed up for Gmail when, it's, when you still needed an invitation for it from a user? Yeah, some early uh, users. So I was also one of those at the end of 2005 when I signed up for Gmail. And I remember that was the first cloud product I started to use. And I was super excited because, you know, like, it was really amazing, this cloud thing, that I could reach my emails from, you know, wherever I went and I didn't need to install an application. So I really loved it. And now who of you remembers the first personalized advert in the sidebar of Gmail? Nobody, none of you experienced that? It happened to me, it was kind of creepy. I had a discussion in an email with my friends and we were talking about travel plans and who is going where. One of them said, oh, we go to Italy, Milan is a beautiful place. And then I got a, you know, like a travel agency advertisement saying, oh, travel to Milan, now it's super cheap. And I was like, hey, you know, this cannot be just a mistake or, you know, like an unfortunate coincidence. So it was really creepy and I remember a lot of my friends or some of my friends said, you know what, I'm stopped using this Gmail thing, they're reading my emails, that's super creepy, I can't, I can't have that. So this is what happened then in 2005, we were kind of conscious about privacy. And now I don't know if I need to ask you, who of you have a smartphone with you? Yeah, actually I'm using it as a clicker today. So this is what happened in just 10 years, right? So back then we were really conscious and we were afraid that a bot, in fact, is going through our emails and now we have a personalized tracker and we bring it everywhere and we let it know everything. It knows where we live, it knows where we wake up, who we know, who we meet, where we go, where we work, you know, everything, how many, you know, how much we step, it's smarter. It knows much things about us than ourselves. And so how it can happen that, you know, it knows all of these things and I hope I'm not the first person telling you this, but we are being measured. You are all being measured by these companies, by your phone providers and by the, the companies that provide the apps and the services that you are using. My name is Zsuzsa Kovács and I work as a senior UX researcher at Prezi for almost four year na years now. Uh, in case you don't know, Prezi is a presentation software company based in Budapest, but we also have an office in San Francisco and I'm using Prezi if you have not noticed so far that it's something different. And I thought I might start with explaining you what a UX researcher is doing at Prezi. So, you know, what does it mean? Because we also used to have UX designers in Hungary, or this is the most or the more common uh, role, but in Prezi it's actually divided. So I'm part of a so-called cross-functional team. And uh, I'm, as a UX researcher, I work together with a product designer and the two of us create the prototypes and set up these experiments and, and work on the design of Prezi, but of course not alone. We also have a product owner or a product manager who wor works really closely with us, but we also involve really following design thinking. Uh, we involve the, the engineers also in the ideation. So of course we have, have some brilliant engineers in the background and not just in the background, but actually being part of, of the, the ideation when we are brainstorming on solutions and they are also coming to the interviews and the usability tests and they, they really love it. And so with this team, what is my role especially, or especially in this team, my role is to research and share it with the team what our users, Prezi users need, right? What are their needs? How do they behave? How they use Prezi? What do they understand? What they don't? Where are their pain points? And it's also really important for me to find out how we can bring value to these people. Why is that so important? Because, because Prezi has more than 70 million users today. And until recently that we hired a few salespeople, we had two sales guys. So it meant that, you know, it was not the salespeople selling Prezi. It was people coming to our website. And if they found value there, then they decided to sign up and maybe pay. If it was not valuable for them, then they simply left. So that's why it's super important that we know how we can bring value. And we use a lot of methods to research that, but I could say that there are two big ways of getting this information. And I would say one way is qualitative and the other is quantitative. So what does it mean? When I say qualitative research, it means that we run interviews, usability tests, for some long-term processes, we also set up sometimes diary studies. But, so it's really important and I, I'm all for qualitative research. It's really powerful and I think it, it gets you most of the learnings that you need. It's really, really good. We do 
uh, weekly usability tests and interviews. We mainly talk to people who are not Prezi users so far, but they present a lot because they want, we want to learn you know, how we can make Prezi suitable for all presenters. And for the usability test, of course, it's really important that they don't know Prezi and our product. And uh, so we do it weekly and we do it remotely. We don't have in-lab tests and interviews. I put here the surveys and that's only because I wanted to mention it since it's something in between qualitative and quantitative. This way you can get a lot of answers for qualitative kind of questions, although we don't do surveys, but that could be another talk of mine why we don't do them. And on fact, or in fact, we do a lot of A-B testing and usage data analysis. So what does it mean? It means that if you are a Prezi user, Prezi is also measuring you. We know if you arrive on our website, we know if you check the pricing page and if you decide to sign up for an account, but you know, that's something you can get from Google Analytics. But we measure much more than that. We actually measure any, all of your clicks. So we measure which template you, you choose and what colors you pick and what fonts you set and how many images you upload. What's more, we can even predict from how much time you spent in the editor for the first time, whether you like the product or not. So if we can, you know, like, see you coming back or probably not really because you were not really, you know, like, uh, convinced by what, what you got. So we are measuring a lot of things. And today what I want to talk to you about is that why you should also measure your users if you're not doing it so. Why it is important not just to talk to these people but also measure what they do. And I brought you some examples from Prezi and some other examples from big companies like Netflix, Spotify, so you will see, I hope you will like these stories. And I thought that I start with bringing you three main ways how you can use data and you know, how you can use this information that you gather. And the first way of using this data is to provide better content for your users, in case you are a content provider, not all of us us. So let's see how Spotify is using data. So who of you is using Spotify? I know it's in Slovakia since 2013. Yeah, quite many. Who of you are paying for Spotify? Okay, quite many, that's nice. Uh, by the way, what I'm doing now is not data measurement. This is a live survey. Just to clarify, what's the difference? You can lie, like you can say, of course I'm paying, paying for Spotify, and in fact you are not. So just to, you know, to make it clear, data is never lying. That's why we like it so much. You know, users can't lie when you are checking their data. They must be really, really tricky. So uh, I don't know if you know that or if you're using or listening to that. Spotify has a weekly, it's called a weekly discovery in, in English. It's a list that they provide me each Monday morning. And it's a set of around 30 songs that they think I might like. And guess what? I really like them. So, you know, when I first came across this, I recognized, wow, Spotify can do something that only my best friends could do before, right? Tell me music I would never hear about or about bands I didn't know they exist. And, you know, I actually like this music. In fact, they do it much better than my friends. Spotify knows more what kind of music I like than myself. I couldn't, you know, like, explain it that well. And so with this, you know, they don't want to be my friend, you know, it's not why they do that. They do that because they want me to keep paying them, and I keep paying them if they bring me value, if they show me things that entertain me. Even if I listen to all my favorite albums and I'm not into mood to any of these, then they you know, show me some new stuff I might be interested about. So they use data, and you know, how, how you like, might know what kind of music I like, is that they check what I do listen, and they check what other people, who are those people who listen to the same thing, and what other things they listen to I never listen to. So this way they can recommend it really smartly, so any new music that I, and I do like that. So that's a good reason for me to wait for Mondays. Another company that is using data really, really heavily, I think they are one of the most data-driven dri companies today, is Netflix. So who of you using Netflix? in Slovakia, uh-huh. Okay, we still have this problem in Hungary that nothing is dubbed or you know, no subtitles are available in Hungarian, so only English-speaking people are fans of Netflix. And Netflix is really good in, again, similarly as Spotify, predicting you things you might like. So if you finish a movie, they will recommend you another movie, right? They are doing it for the same reason, because they know if you're not watching Netflix, you will probably stop paying them. If you're watching it more and more and more, you know, if it gets kind of a a little bit addictive, if they provide you, you know, new kind of things you might watch, then you will keep paying them. And of course, you will enjoy the service much more, right? In fact, they do this recommendation as well that 75% of all content on Netflix that is watched 
is based on recommendations. So it's not movies or series people search for or choose, but it's something Netflix recommended them. So they do it quite well, I guess. And so I have another question. Who of you are House of Cards fans? Okay, some. Yeah, I like to spot out people who don't pay for Netflix and still are House of Cards fans. <laughs> there are quite some. Okay, so I'm a huge House of Cards fan. And what is really interesting in that story, and I was amazed when I read about it, is that uh, when Netflix decided to invest $100 million in that series, it was not that they were hoping for it will be a, su a success, but they knew it, and they knew it from data. They checked that who are those people in, uh, in among their users who watched Social Network, which was directed by David Fincher, who is, by the way, also the director of House of Cards, or the producer and director of some of the, the episodes. And they found that those people who watched Social Network they really like the British original series because it's based on a British um, series. And, um, oh my God, I got a huge light here. So those people who also like the British original, they also, so most of them also watched at least one Kevin Spacey movie. And Kevin Spacey is the star of House of Cards. So the combination of these three elements, they knew that there are a lot of people who would be interested in that. So when they invested, they knew it will be a success. And it, in fact, became a huge success. And what is also super exciting that they did 10 different trailers. So it's not just, you know, they made, you know, a data driven decision to make this and how to make this, but they also made 10 different trailers so that they can offer you the one that you will most probably, you know, make you excited about the series. So if you are for, you know, strong women characters in movies, then they will show you a trailer that showcases the strong women characters of House of Cards. If you are a huge Kevin Spacey fan because you watched all of his movies, you will get a trailer which really showcases Kevin Spacey. Or if you are a Fincher, you know, you get what I mean. So they, ma they made many different trailers to really, really catch you. This is also a brilliant data-driven decision, right? And so an example from Prezi as well, how we use data to, to provide content. We are not a content provider, but we have something that I would say is a semi-content, and those are the templates. What you see here is the template chooser. If you go to prezi.com and decide to build a Prezi, then you can choose from one of our around 100 templates that we offer you. And a template will make it easier for you to start because it gives you a nice theme, design, some visual elements. It also provides you a structure into which you can put your content. And it also gives you a metaphor. So you have a nice story you know, that helps you to say what you want to say in your presentation. And uh, I participated in this, in this project. It was a one and a half years project and it was, we did really deep data analysis in this. And why is that? Because if you ask people about whether they like a template or not, they would say different things. Everybody has a different taste in this. But we were not really interested if they like them, but we wanted to know if they are successful with them. And why is that? Because when we started to build templates, we didn't have any onboarding for Prezi. So templates were the only way how we could explain our users what Prezi is, how it's different from PowerPoint, and how you can make a good presentation. And that was something also really, really important for us that we wanted people to build nice presentations because a presentation is something you usually show to other people, right? So if our users are creating crappy presentations and they are showing it to a lot of other people, that's not really good marketing for us. So this was a way to help them and we managed to improve the templates and make our users more successful with it. So these are some examples how you can provide better content. But as I mentioned, not all of us are content providers. So let's see how you can use data in another way. You can provide better usability for your users. So this is a really famous case study from Jared Spool. I don't know if you know Jared. He's a really famous UX uh, uh, expert and speaker. And it's a, actually, it's an old one, so maybe you heard about that. He calls it the $300 million button. So it's a worthy button, right? And uh, so at Best Buy, they, they do some funnels. This is also a thing you can do with data. And this is a funnel I brought you. It's not the real funnel from Jared's story, but it could be. Because what they had, what was the problem at Best Buy, why they called Jared and his team, it was that they realized that there are a lot of people who put a lot of stuff in their basket or shopping cart and they don't pay for it. They just leave the site and they leave these goods in the shopping cart. And the estimated amount of these goods left in the shopping cart was around $300 million. So it's a lot, right? And Best Buy thought, oh, maybe I could still get some money from these $300 million. And so they had a funnel. This is how they recognized the problem. And you, this 
could be the, the one saying, you know, from the 100% of people who arrive on the website, maybe 73% puts things into the shopping cart and only 84% pays for it and or starts the checkout process maybe and only 21 finishes. So you see that from 100, you get down to 21. This, is, this could be a funnel. Of course, I don't know the real funnel of Best Buy, but funnels are good in this. So you can see that in a long process, where are you losing most of your users? And so they didn't know what is the reason for that. You know, why these people are not paying for that? Because they thought this is more than you know, just those who then change their minds. So Jared did some usability tests. And this is a really powerful example that shows how you can combine qualitative and quantitative. So he did some usability tests. And, and I, he was interested in you know, why people don't pay for it at that moment. And it turned out that in the paying process, there was a mandatory registration step. So when people would say, check out, you know, I want to buy these things, you had to register. So you had to generate a password, enter your email address, your, your address to ship to. And of course, Best Buy thought it's a good idea since these people come back the next time. They don't need to enter all of these things, credit card information, address. But still, when people were here for the first time, what they said to Jared is that they are not quite ready for this relationship yet. They are not sure whether they want to register. You know, who knows? Maybe I never come back. Why to do that? And also, it turned out that those who did register already, most probably they forgot their passwords, right? Because we have so many passwords that, you know, who can remember all of them? And the password recovery process, again, you know, everything that gets you out from the payment process and allows you to recognize that you got an email from your boss because that's where you get your password, you know, changing email, that's not a good idea because then most probably those people will for just forget about they wanted to buy anything. So we are really happy about that, but still, you know, like, we have, as I said, we have 70 million users. They made millions of prezzies. So, to, you know, to just switch, it's not so easy. So back then, because of Flash, they couldn't check it on their mobile phones. And we've seen we are losing a lot of people. You know, they, all they got was an invitation to download the app, because there they can view it. And what we realized that just a really small percentage of people downloaded the app. So what did we do? We made the button bigger, and then we made their uh, banner, and we made the banner red, and we tried to you know, make them, or we thought maybe they just don't realize there's the app they should download. And of course, the numbers didn't went too, too high, so we did some usability tests. And I asked them, you know, like, I asked them to, to go through this process, and some, the really honest ones, explain me, and this might be familiar for you, they were just not quite ready for this relationship yet, right? We are not downloading just any app now anymore. Our phones are full. My phone, I think there are 90% of apps I, would ne I never use. I just have them. I should delete probably. So I'm not really downloading new apps unless I know I will use that often. So this was the fact. People are not downloading apps just for one, you know, just to watch a press that they don't even know what is. So what we did instead is we, we gave up this download the app thing, and we said, OK, let's make a viewer, which is a bit simplified. We made quickly a light viewer, which didn't have all the transitions, but it actually mimicked it. It was some kind of a light Prezi experience for the full experience. They still need to download the app, but at least they get something. They see the content, and, and probably that's what they, they get there for, to see what the presentation is about. And today, 90% of all our views are coming from the mobile side. So <laughs> you might guess that this was uh, a good decision we made. And I have another uh, example, and that was for a bad measurement. So you, you can also measure data in a, in a bad way that you shouldn't do. When I joined Prezi, we had a feature, and that was called Present Online. Today, we call it Remote Presentation. It means that I can stand here and present to you, and you might be at another country, and you can follow my presentation, something like what GoToMeeting is doing, but you can do it with Prezi on its own. And, um, so when I joined the company, I was keep asking, why are you calling it present online? Every Prezi is online, right? Can you actually do anything? Can you present offline? Or you know, why do you call it like that? It doesn't make any sense. But what I always got as an answer is, we measured that. This is the best name. We did an experiment, and this is the one that won. So I was like, OK, it sounds really scientific, so you know, I, I should not say anything. And then one day, the UX researcher who, were, who actually was in that experiment that decided the name came to me and said, Guess what happened to me? A colleague was presenting at Prezi, so you know, someone who works at Prezi, and he wanted to present and he wanted to make the presentation itself full screen, which is this tiny button here in the corner, and he didn't know it's there. So you know what he did? He went, clicked present online, start presenting online, it made it full screen, actually. It was a completely different thing, but by the way, it made it full screen, and this is how he presented us in a, in a meeting room. He said, you know what, I have this 
hypothesis that maybe you know the experiment one because we were only measuring you know which button name was clicked the most and maybe people were clicking it because they didn't know how to make it full screen anyway or maybe they thought this is the way to present the Prezi so we made another experiment and the only thing we did is now you see this is the new name already because we renamed it afterwards we learned that it was a failed experiment at first and we put a present button between edit and pre present online and guess what the present button got the most clicks so we realized okay there is another kind of problem here people when they arrive they don't know how to you know what to do with this thing how to start it and that sounds like an action that makes sense so they just click it so after that we we took another experiment and we did some usability tests and this is how we came up with this name so Measurement can help you to, to make good decisions and pr improve usability, but you, know, you, you need to make sure to, to set it up right because you can also fail. And the third way of using data is that data can help you to make better decisions if you do it right, so not as I said in this last example. And one famous example for a data-driven decision, or actually it's an iterative improvement uh, famous example is Obama's first campaign from 2008. So if you, in case you didn't know, when Obama started in, or went to the elections in 2008, he was a, a young junior senator in the US. Nobody really knew him. And his opponent, McCain, had a lot of really wealthy supporters. So he had enough money for his campaign. Obama didn't. And the only way he could get that money that he needed for the campaign was to get it from the public. And so what he did, he had a really professional team that set up a website and they knew that the most important part of the website is the splash screen that comes up at the moment when you enter the site for the first time. And they are asking for your email address. And they didn't you know, think that they know what is the best way of this splash screen to look like to get the most emails. They set up an experiment. They created a lot of around 30 different versions. What they were playing with, here you can see, Two examples, I'm not sure you can read everything, but you see the, the image is different. They even experimented with some videos and didn't work well. So they had different images, they had different slogans, like one says, get involved, the other says, change uh, we can believe in. And they were even playing with this button title, one says, sign up, the other says, learn more. So they made a lot of different variations and they put it out and they measured which one would get them the most email. So which one is more engaging for their users? And so just to feel, you know, how much you can improve, the left one is the worst, one of the worst performing versions, the right one is the best performing version, and there was 30% difference between the two. What does that mean? Obama at the end uh, collected around 10 million email addresses, so it's 3 million he could have lost if they are going with a bad version instead of the good one that they measured. And he also raised $60 million that helped him to become the president. And $20 million is, again, you know, not something that you want to lose on a not so well performing splash screen. So this was one of, this is the, I think, one of, or the first really huge A-B test that happened. And it was so successful that the campaign manager of, or, or the data analyst of his campaign, Obama's campaign, founded then the company Optimizely, which is now one of the most commonly used A-B testing platform that we also use at Prezi. Uh, and we also do a lot of A-B tests, and we also do a lot of iterative improvements. And one of the examples I brought you was, again, about the templates. So as I mentioned, you, we managed to measure how successful users become with our templates. What does it mean? It means so success, we measure success by they starting a Prezi, finishing it, and then presenting it to someone. So most probably showing it to someone else because they are so proud. Finishing means that they put enough content to it that we, we believe it's a finished presentation. And so we could then you know, compare templates. This made people more successful, this made people less, least successful. And at one point, we call, uh, these were the 10 least uh, successful ones, which didn't perform really well. And we thought be before deleting them, because we had to delete many, but before deleting them, we tried to improve them. So we had these rules that we came up with, what we believed made the templates easier to use, and we we use these rules on these badly performing templates. And here you can see this was the or original set. We made an A version for all of these 10, and we made a B version for all of these 10. And we ran, a, it's in fact, an ABC test. We ran an AB test, and we measured which one performs the, the, the best, and we kept only those ones. And uh, it also means, of course, that we had to, you see that we made three versions for one template, and then we kept only one. And that actually shows also the magnitude of this thing. For the 100 templates that we have today, we created around 300. 
But we managed to double the success our users had with this. So this is a huge improvement that we managed to do with this. And, and of course, it made our users uh, more happy with Prezi and more successful. But in fact, every new feature is an A-B test at Prezi. We never release anything for 100% at first, but usually we started with a low amount of people, like 2% of our users or 10% of our users. So try it out to see whether we broke something or you know, if everything is still okay. And when we see that it's, it's getting better, then of course we increase it to 40%, 60, and usually then it goes to 100. Oftentimes we also have features that never goes out to 100% because we want to measure the long-term effect. For example, whether it makes people to retain more or less. Retaining means that if they, after one year, come back and renew their license or not. So there are some long-term things, of course, that you cannot measure in an experiment that runs for a few weeks. And sometimes you also test variants, like with the button example that I showed you, and that was a bad measurement. But if you do it right, you know, when you have two versions and you tested them and both of them are understood by the users, you just don't know which one you know, makes the more successful actions or sometimes clicks are actually a good indicator, not always. Then we put out these, these versions and we measure again which one is the best one. So these were the three ways of how you can use data. So to make, provide better content, provide better usability, and make better decisions. And my main message for you is, of course you should do qualitative tests, of course you should run usability tests and interviews, but you should combine it with data measurement every time you can, because the two will be much more powerful together, and you can learn much more about your users. And you can also measure some things that you will never learn on a usability test that in fact is a, is an artificial situation. So if you want to see how your users naturally use your product, measurement can help you in that. But of course, it never answers the hows or the whys. You will see some trends. You will see that there is a problem, like in the Best Buy case study. And then a qualitative a usability test might answer you, you know, what is the reason for that? So it's really powerful together. And I'm not finished yet. I have one another really important thing to mention because I think we cannot talk about data usage today without getting into the ethical question, how you should use data and how you shouldn't. Because I think there are already a lot of companies abusing this information that they know about us. And I brought you some good examples and some nice, ex or some bad examples to see you know, what you should do and what you shouldn't do. All the examples I mentioned until now, I think they are completely harmless. So these are good ways of using usage data, but let's see some not so good examples. I start with a good one though still. It seems I really like Spotify and how they use their data. They did the Thanks 2016, it was weird campaign in London and maybe also in the US at the end of 2016. And what they did is that they, they got some super exciting things from their data when they, while they were analyzing and they made posters out of it. It sounds scary, I know, but it was completely anonym. And actually it had a really nice caring touch, because these were messages like this. Dear person who played sorry 42 times on Valentine's Day, what did you do? I think this is kind of funny, right? Because they found it in their data and they didn't really understand. So this is another one. To the 1,235 guys who love the girls' night playlist this year, we love you. Or this one. Dear person who made the playlist called One Night Stand with Job, Jeb Bush, uh, like he's a Bond girl in a European casino. We have so many questions. And one of my other favorites is, uh, dear 3,749 uh, 3, people who streamed, it's the end of the world as we know it, or at the day of the Brexit vote. And it says, hang on there, or hang in there. I think these are really, really funny messages, right? It's not harming anyone. Even if I was the person who played Sorry 42 times on Valentine's Day, probably I would find it kind of funny that I became kind of anonymously famous, right? It's not harming anyone. And it's with these, you know, the, the message itself shared some kind of a, you know, a caring touch, like, are you okay? Everything is fine. Don't give up, you know, Brexit, okay, it happened, but you know, it's not the end of the world yet. So I, I really like this. And it's a really smart marketing campaign showing that although they are measuring you, but, and they know a lot of things about you, you know, they care. And it's also actually funny that it's, it's not creepy anymore. We kind of know that these companies know these things about us. And I think Spotify used it really nicely. Target, on the other hand, had a really bad, bad story a few years back. Who of you knows the, the Target direct marketing fail story? 
Yeah, some people. Okay, but most of you don't, so I can tell it. So what happened? Customer service got a really angry phone call one day from a father who was asking, like, what were you thinking when you sent my teenage daughter, who is still in high school, some special offer for diapers and baby cribs? Like, do you really want her to become a teenage mom? Or what, what, you know, what should this supposed to mean? And of course, customer service said, oh my god, this is a terrible mistake. We deeply apologize for that. They really felt bad. And the father said, okay. And of course, he was really mad. And we can understand why. And a few weeks after, the customer service person felt still so bad about this, this story that he called back the father to offer him a special discount or to follow up on this story. And a few weeks later, the father actually admitted that, yeah, in fact, his daughter was pregnant. And so it was, not a, it was not a coincidence what just happened here. Target knew before the father that his girl was pregnant. So how did, could this could happen? Target, of course, knows, as any retail company knows, that if you, know, if you manage to get, a, get a, a woman or a family, one of your lawyer customers, before their child is born, that's like bingo, a lot of money will be spent in your store, right? So they wanted to find it out way before the baby is born, and you know, tie you to them with special discounts. So what they did, they had a super kick-ass data analyst team, and they asked them to you know, find out how they could you know, like predict if someone is pregnant from their customers early enough. What they did is, you know, they have loyalty cards. So the loyalty card, but even if you're just using your credit card, it helps Target to, to know, you know which shoppings are tied to the same person. So they, and they had years of data, so they just had to analyze that and find out that before someone starts to buy diapers and baby cribs, what happens before that? And things they found out, it's not that they, someone bought a pregnancy test, no, it's much trickier than that. They recognized that at the beginning of the second trimester, a person would start to buy a lot of unscented body lotion. Body lotion is a, you know, a thing everybody's buying, but not unscented and not in that quantity. But they also found out that around the 20th week, yeah, they are so precise, around the 20th week of pregnancy, pregnant women would start to stock up on magnesium, calcium, and zinc. So this is something you might need. And also, when the delivery date is coming closer, they start to stock up, stock up on scent-free soap, extra big bags of cotton balls, hand sanitizers, and wash clothes. So, you know, they re this seems so innocent, right? And still these things, in fact, 25 products, if you analyze them together, it might g give you really precisely if someone is pregnant or not. In fact, Target might know more precisely your delivery day than your doctor. And so, you know, what did they do with this information? At the right time, they sent you a special personalized advert for magnesium or for the things that you might need at that certain time. So after this, this you know, story that was really a big scandal and everybody was outraged, that they cannot go that greedy. They know a lot of things about their customers, but they need to hide it and they, they need to pretend they know, in fact, less because people will freak out and they will not use them anymore. Actually, just try to think about what Tesco knows about you in case you have a loyalty card, because Target we don't have. And so what they did is they still are sending personalized campaigns for their users or customers, but they are doing it in a smarter way. So they put there the diapers and they put some garden furniture next to it or some, I don't know, kitchenware that, you know, it doesn't seem so personalized and to you, but in fact they know they, that you will probably pick the diapers. But it's not so creepy, right? You don't know they know so much about you. But this was a really nasty story, so I, you know, it's, it's really easy to step over that line until it's okay or, you know, it's kind of bad. Uh, I have another good example now to change it, and that's from Twitter. So when you sign up for Twitter, and they are really proud of that, you don't need to add or give actually any personal information. You don't need to admit your gender, your age. Also, the city where you live in, it's completely optional whether you want to give it or not. You can see that I, for example, didn't give my birthday to Twitter. But they don't need me to tell it, because after one month of usage, they will know it anyways. They can predict really well whether you are female or male, and how old you are, of course, not to the to your birth date, but you know, to put you into this category that they need for advertisement, right? Because when you advertise on Twitter, on the other hand, you can like decide whether you want your advert to see by men or, or women, and you can define the age group. And probably they also need it for some statistics that they show to their upper management or to, again, 
analyze usage data if it differs in different age groups or in genders. And I think this is actually a nice thing that they do because I will have no benefit from they knowing my age and gender. So they don't ask me, they don't bother me on when I'm registering, they will predict it anyway. So they can know it from their data. And yeah, they don't ask me. And Twitter is actually really proud of you know, not intriguing too much, and they are actually not giving out anything to NSA. NSA is not really happy about that, also that they don't ask personal information. And they are really proud of not being like Facebook. They are big competitors in the US and in all of the world. And yeah, Facebook on the other hand asks you a lot of personal information, but even if you don't give it out, they know a lot of things about you. So again, who of you are using Facebook? Raise your hands, a lot of people. Okay, who of you used Facebook but are not using anymore? Oh, some quitters, okay, yeah, it's a trend. I also had a Facebook free week just a few weeks ago. I survived. Uh, so who of you who are using Facebook thinks that, you know, you probably liked 65 things since you like Facebook or since you use Facebook? Did you click the like button 65 times already? 65, not too much, it's my two-day dose, okay. So what do you think Facebook knows about you based on 65 likes? Any guesses? I know this would be perfect for a poll, but I didn't set it up. So who do you think, what do you think Facebook knows about you from 65 likes? No tips? Probably your gender and age, right? Because if Twitter knows that, then Facebook will know that as well. Okay, so I, I will tell you, and of course it means that it's only from the 65 likes. It's not by analyzing your profile picture or checking your family, you know, what, if you have said it or not, just by 65 likes. They will know the skin, your skin color, 95% of currency. It's actually pretty good, right? And again, not by analyzing your profile picture. Maybe you didn't upload any. They know your skin color. They will know your sexual, orienta sexual orientation, again, 88% of the currency. That's, again, pretty high. They will know whether you are a Democrat or a Republican. Now, this was an American study, but I guess here, you know, it has... So they will know which party you are in favor. They will know your intelligence level. They will know your religious affiliation, whether you are religious or not, and, you know, where would you go. Whether you use alcohol, cigarette, or drugs. They will know that from 65 likes. They, and they will even know whether your parents got divorced or not. Again, not from your, you know, set family things. Even if you didn't say anything in your profile, just from 65 likes. And that study was done by this guy in 2012 before you could do other than just like something. Now, imagine what they know now from your loves and hates and angry faces and crying ones. I can't even imagine the, the amount of things that they know about you. And one thing you should not forget, because of course now Facebook is only using that for advertisement. Jared Spool likes to say that, say that, and I really agree with him. If you are using a free product, you are the product. So, you know, the question is how Facebook will use this information of you and who they will decide to sell it for. Just think about that. Who do you want to know that you are using drugs sometimes? And my last, uh, my last example of how you can use data or how data and data usage can affect your world, and I will keep it short because my time is up. Uh, so about the last elections, uh, I don't know if you read about that, but Zuckerberg and his team, in the previous elections, they made a small feature which only allowed people to say on their walls that I voted. And this small feature, increased the amount of people who went to vote. In fact, you know, this is peer pressure. I've seen all my friends went to vote, so, oh my God, I probably should also go. I didn't want to, but okay, I will do. And so from that, Zuckerberg realized that they have a huge power at hand, right? He knew that they, with Facebook, could decide the elections, and he promised the people that he will not. He will not intrude, he will not do any effect. But I believe they still did. And the effect is that, I don't know if you knew that, but you don't, when you go to the internet and you search something or you go on your Facebook page, you don't see the whole internet. You see a small filtered bubble. I really like this picture. It's from a TED talk from 2011. It was already known and it was already happening five years ago. And a guy made a TED talk on that. And you can see that also Amazon, Netflix, Google, a lot of companies are doing that. Twitter is also filtering your content. And it means that, you know, how they are filtering that, they know what you like, they know what politi political party you are in favor, you know whether you're religious or not, and they will show you content that makes you feel good. 
So they will not show you those guys and those friends post who think differently than you. They will only show you the opinion you share and that makes you feel good and that makes you feel that everybody around you think the same way as you do because this is what makes you feel good, right? So how could this affect still the American election? All the Trump fans or Trump supporters thought everybody is a Trump supporter because you know how you transfer that or how you translate that all my friends is the world, right? Everybody on Facebook is a Trump supporter and Hillary supporters so the same. Everybody, the whole world is a Hillary supporter. So I think this might have an effect on not, you know, people not going to the elections because both parties were actually completely tr right, uh, sure about them winning. But I think the, the more serious effect of this is that people couldn't exchange opinions Nobody could have this argument on Facebook from one side with the other side trying to convince each other or just change opinions. And what is, what is much worse is that it actually really different and like tore these two groups apart and they couldn't meet and they couldn't read each other's opinions. So this is what made this huge difference between these two groups and this ha hatred that happened when they then met in real life because everybody thought that, you know, everybody who makes sense, who are my friends, the whole world thinks like I do. So these were some examples, as I told you, some good and bad. So I brought you two more good and three bad examples of, of how you should not use data and what you should not do with this data. And so now you might be wondering, like, okay, first she said we should measure our users. Now she said we shouldn't measure our users. You know, what, what is she trying to say? What I'm saying is that you should measure your users because it's a great tool and it's really powerful. But be careful. Don't do it. Do it for your users and not for yourself. And I have just a really short ending story. I had a colleague at Prezi, and we can have a business card where you can put just anything to the backside, any quote, anything. And he always wanted to put it, but he was never brave enough. He wanted to put on his business card, I watch people, but not in a creepy way. Because he was a UX researcher, right? So this is my message for you. Me measure your users, but not in a creepy way. Thank you very much. I'm not, I am running. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jean, for your, uh, for your talk. And now, even thank you guys for your questions. Uh, in order to keep us focused, we will trim this time a little so that we have enough time for a break and you will be focused when the next presentation comes. Uh, so, the first question, a nice one. I'm a dummy in data collection. Thank you for your confession. Just thank write you. your name next time. Uh, where do I start? That's a really good question. I think Google Analytics is a good start, or reading a lot of case studies can be a good start. So yeah, I, I think you know, even if you start it really, really small and you have a website and you just put Google Analytics to see you know, how people, you know, which pages that they visit and which pages not, is, you can learn already a lot from that. But of course, the, the more pro powerful it, it gets if you have logs. So at Prezi, each button click and each I wouldn't say each mouse movement because that's like exaggerating, but each click is a log line, maybe several log lines, and that is really like you can learn anything from that. Of course, it's anonymized data, so I couldn't check you know, what text you put into your Prezi. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in whether you put text into your Prezi or not. And uh, so I think a good start is to read case studies and try out Google Analytics. I think there are a lot of free... Um, free online courses on this matter, probably also on Coursera or lynda.com. You can go there and just you know, start it. I really recommend you to do that. Thank you. The second question, is there any official education for user researchers? And <clears throat> what would you advise someone when he or she wants to uh, start or become a user re uh, experience researcher? This is a good question and we have the same problem in Hungary. We still don't have official uh, education, but not just for UX researchers, not even for UX designers. And what we started in, in Budapest, and this is something I would encourage you to do because you probably also have here people who are doing this, in fact, for long years, even if not officially. We started some evening classes and some trainings and we teach people how they could become UX designers and UX researchers. So we teach our own experience, what we learned during these years that we are doing that. I really believe that you shouldn't like over study this thing, read about it because you can do, use, even an interview you can do it wrongly and, and not learn anything or in fact think that you learned and in fact you didn't. 
read about it, read about how to do a usability test, or again, there is a Coursera course in UX design, uh, and you should do that, and then once you, you know the basics, you should do it. I think that's the best way to learn it. I, myself, I'm a developer, I studied computer science and mathematics, and then after like a few years, I decided that probably this programming thing is not something I wanna do in 10 years, and, and I, I was at SAP back then, and I, I got the chance of trying myself out as a UX designer because there were not many. There were not any in Budapest at that time. So I was really lucky because I could, I could learn it. I got the chance and I could learn it while doing. But this is the, the way I believe it in. You can, of course, also read books. There are tons of amazing books. And I, I recommend you to read those as well. But do it. I think this is the best way to learn it. Uh, and I think this will be the last question. And you will find the answers for the other questions on the website. So, when there is a complex redesign needed, what is the hierarchy of problem solution, or what to focus on first? Wow, a, cu a curious person is asking some nasty questions. Um, Eleven complex, likes. Yeah, complex redesign. I think with the con so. A complex redesign should start with research. I always think that you know everything should start with research, and research should be involved all the way because I believe in iteration. So what I would do is first, you know, check it yourself to get an idea of, or have a feel of where do you think the most big, the biggest problems are. But it shouldn't be you know based on which you start. But you should do a lot of usability tests. Test it with at least three or five people. It could be your friends. Test it. You will have a much better understanding of where people are lost. And this is a good start of you know, how to make the, the first problems better. And then how uh, we work at Prezi, and again, iteratively, this is what I believe in, that if you have a solution idea, build a prototype and test it. Test it with the user, see if it works. If not, go back and think of another idea and test it. And you know, once it works, then you can go to the, the next problem, solve it, test it, and this is the, the best way to solve especially complex problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for the answers.